I'm Max Beasley, and you're listening to the 5D Podcast. This is Andrew Berkeley, and you're listening to the 5D Podcast. Hey, this is Level Up Leroy, and you're listening to the 5D Podcast. Get yourself ready for an interdimensional sensory experience. Welcome all to the dimension of sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. This is the 5D Podcast. Hello there and welcome to the 5D Podcast brought to you by Stuart and Zach from 5D-blog.com. Welcome to those of you listening live on Twitch. Also, welcome to those of you listening on iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn and Stitcher. Be sure to check out the 5D-blog.com website for blog articles, competitions and news. And of course, check out the 5D YouTube channel, the details for which can be found on the 5D website. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk. So I know I kind of pestered you a wee bit. So I'm really glad you kind of listened to my story. Oh, yeah. You no, know, I, I don't tell me my instincts about which people to do this <laughs> I tell you a call. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, my usual co host can't do because he is he's a, uh, he's not a, an Apple guy. He doesn't do the Macs or anything. He's on a PC. So he can't do this FaceTime. But he's listening in to oh, okay. our, our call. So so if you could say hi to Zach, I know you would appreciate <laughs> You would really appreciate it. Hello, Zach. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> oh, he says you're fine. He says he's fine. He's cool. Um, so, um, there's a couple of things obviously I want to talk to you about. I mean, I know that the Walking Dead thing is going to come up. Um, I'll, I'll need to talk to you about that. Um, but can I just ask about how you got started off then? Because obviously, I think, am I right in saying that you had quite, I mean, you talked about your mum being quite creative and inspiring. Were they kind of like what inspired you to get into acting at a young, kind of a young age? Well, you know, I, I did, my mother had higher aspirations. <laughs> 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 but uh, she did, she was an enabler in respect to the fact that she sewed and um, and we didn't have a lot of dough. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I always seemed to have a preference from the time I was three, if not before, on to um, sport Gazis, as opposed to playing with uh, yeah. the trucks like yeah. normal masculine boys. I was <laughs> a little fairy boy. Um, <laughs> I just want to wear costumes. I would be someone else. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to live out. Uh, I think I, I really have analyzed it a little bit. Uh, there was a, a magical thinking involved. There was this idea that... Um, that I could time travel, right, and and that I could shape shift. Okay, okay. And those were like two sort of secret powers that I think <laughs> I was drawn to. Uh, the the characters, um, and and it's interesting because um, whether it's the ancestral thing I was referring to there, the, the yeah, apparently many generations of high priests on the island of sky. <laughs> um, longing to to cleave back to my roots because we've gotten stranded over here in the states yeah um uh, a lot of my earliest characters were uh were english uh or the i mean i was i the costume she first made when i was three was a, a really beautifully done up uh, robin hood uh hat feather smock with the fringe yeah, yeah. and uh, a quiver and full of arrows and rubber <laughs> tipped. Okay. Um, I didn't see it that way. <laughs> they were just as lethal. Uh, good bow. And uh, I, I think I might have even had some tights in that set up with some little Oh, so you went for the, you, it? Was, it was definitely the, the Errol Flynn sort of, sort of look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I've seen that. I've yeah. somehow seen that. Uh, it had been on television or something, and I'd seen the Errol Flynn, and I was just obsessed. I had to, yeah. I had to embody that. And then it was Doctor Doolittle after that. But they they both involved very elaborate, apparently elaborate <laughs> English accents. Um, 
on, but at three and five and, and, <laughs> and, and the, the costumes, you know, had a bowler and the, you know, like it, it was just, and I, we lived on this farm and, and I could just go out and it wasn't a matter of performing Yeah, for others. It was really a matter of, of being in my own mind and going out into the world yeah, as yeah. someone else from another time. A lot of the characters uh, were from other times as well. And uh, yeah, um, the, so she was a creative in that respect. Uh, she was a teacher. Uh, she was uh, a wise woman. She was a, a seeker. Um, and my parents had met on a farm that was inhabited primarily by expat Brits that had come over during the war. Um, but they were all seekers and, and interested in ideas. And, yeah. And, uh, and th so, but there were a lot of people from all over the world on this farm. And so I was around accents all the time. And I was really drawn to the sounds of accents. There were lords and ladies. Yeah. And there were, and there were Cockneys. <laughs> and, there were, and there were Scots and Irish and yeah. uh, all sorts of characters on this farm. And I, my sister and I were the only kids. And my sister was an introvert and just wanted to read. And I just wanted to go out and experience and get in everybody's way. But yeah. they were kind enough not to make me feel as though I was in the way. And they would show me whatever they were doing whatever, like churning butter and baking bread or making cheese or milking goats or taking care of the chickens. And, and I was just in in it and listening to the sounds of these yeah. accents all the time yeah. and fascinated by them. And, uh, and so even I think the, because it's not as clear the, the, the class distinction relative to regional accents and, and, uh, in, in the states aren't quite as clearly defined as mm. class accents mm. in, in the UK. And so there was something that was very interested in that as well. And the guy who was up on the shed tearing off uh, the old roof and throwing it down. And I was just standing because I couldn't stop listening to him say, why not your heads below? <laughs> <laughs> and that he was saying Ed's instead of heads. And, and then, yeah. uh, well, uh, well, see, I'm originally from from originally from Yorkshire, so that's north of England. So, you, yeah, I yeah. mean, and you're right. Uh, even within Yorkshire, there are distinct accents within that particular area. And I will say Ed rather than Head. You know, my, mine will be you know, watch your head, and you know that sort of thing. Um, I, I think I saw in an interview that you pride yourself on on the. Is that where it came from then? This this that kind of ability to do the accents to you know yeah, be authentic in, in that sort of thing yeah that's okay it's, i don't know what it is about this this charger but it has a weird <laughs> different looking thing and it caused the sound to just go down every time i like oh. i can still see you um, yes sir that's all right. so uh but yeah, the accents thing. So I've I've seen, I've seen an interview before that you you weird. You're... It's going down again. I wonder what the heck that is. Yeah, no, it just goes straight down. Well, I'll uh, I'll see if I can go without the charge for a bit longer. And uh, if I die, if you die, you die. <laughs> it, it'll be significantly symbolic. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't want to be responsible for killing Xander Berkeley on, on, you know, I think, you know, I don't want to have that hanging over me, man, you know. Just on the live feed. <laughs> um, um, so, anyway, yeah, so, uh, listen, I mean, the thing about your career, which I, I I don't know, I for me, I think if I was never an actor, which I, I can't act to save my life, but if I was an actor, I'd love to be, I think, in your situation where you've got this huge body of work, but you don't, you may disagree with me, but you don't seem to have been kind of pigeonholed, you don't seem to have been typecast, um, you've done a whole wide range of things, is, is, would you agree that that's from yeah. your own point well, of view? Well, I got typecast a little bit, I, I uh, you know, just to harp on my mother for, because her maiden name was Harper, um, and to make a bad pun. Um, <laughs> I tried to ignore that, I was going to was gonna let the pun go, it's okay. <laughs> um, you know, never, ne never pass up an opportunity for that. That's my uh, you know, and she, my father was an artist and was very, um, you know, in support of my, I, I could paint and draw from, I, I drew very well when I was very young and I knew I had support if I wanted to pursue that as an option. And, 
he'd done some community theater and it introduced me to great filmmakers as soon as PBS started airing the greats of the 60s in the 70s when I was in high school um, and they we they would be on every Saturday night and he would introduce me to uh, Kurosawa and Fellini and Truffaut yeah, and yeah. Bergman and all the greats and, and really sort of introduced me to uh, the maison scene as well as the particularities of, of character actors who he was very drawn to that were able to transform and become a part of a repertoire, as it were, a repertory company of, yeah. for a given director. And so I was introduced to that idea and drawn to it early on. Um, but in combination with a, an injunction my mother gave me when I left New York to go to California when I was very young for, for an agent having seen me in a play and taking me out uh, to L.A. And she said, uh, first she said, well, now, honey, you know, money's only a problem if you have too much or too little of it, don't you? <laughs> and I said, well, I've only experienced the latter. I've yet to experience the former. My mother, I'll have to take it what you should take my word for it. it and you'll find it to be true. And, uh, and then she said, and with regard to fame, all I will tell you is you just be careful what you ask for because you may just get it. <laughs> Then what? She double then wanted me, and I, 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 so I, I lived in a kind of morbid fear of of fame. Yeah, for some reason and she wanted me to follow uh, other impulses that I'd manifested in school towards maybe the diplomatic services. So okay, okay. I say a little bit more respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and <laughs> uh, I had those, uh, I had diplomatic tendencies and uh, <laughs> I had an interest in travel and I was interested in government. Um, and so I, I that would have been a, a more, um, I think, appealing route uh, from her point of view. But my father was very much a, an artist who not been supported by his parents to become one. And so he was determined to be in support. and. And I very gratefully accepted that support um, from him and her willingness. And so, but I did always, uh, I think I cleaved to his vision of what a cool acting career would be, <laughs> which was the, the character acting. Yeah. Uh, and, and flying a little bit under the radar, being sort of appe appealing to people like him who had really discerning taste. <laughs> That that sort of innate snobbery yeah. I think was <laughs> conditioned into me. Like I, I only want really cool people to get who, um, and to to avoid the stigma of fame. Where in a sense, I remember working with Barry Corbin way early on, and he sort of we felt a kindred spirit uh, back then. And and you know, he I remember him saying, "Why do people want to be famous?" You know, our muse is studying people. Yeah. You get famous, you get cut off from that, and everybody's studying you. <laughs> Ooh. And and I, I, that's like, wow, yeah, of course you get. You, this is what happens. So many great comedians, a lot of great musicians, a lot of great uh, actors get success really early on, and in the moment they reach that super fame they become isolated yeah. uh, from the general public because it's such a nuisance to go out and have people just in your face yeah. all the time. And, you know, they have every right to it because you're now a commodity and you, you it's, it's a trade-off. Yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah. It's, it was always, it was uh, just a, I had an approach avoidance because, of course, you, you want access to the best roles and you can't get access to the best roles unless you're famous. Yeah. Um, is this why but, there may be, I've read as well, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but is this why I think you're initially reluctant to commit to a, a long-term TV series like 24 when I yeah. think it was first offered? Because of, was that kind of related to the, that reluctance to be part of that then for, you know, that, that well, sort yeah, of reason? Well, yeah, because if you, if you play the same role over and over, and it's on people's TV sets every week, and they're watching you, it, it becomes that much harder for them to break the association of you as that character. Yeah, yeah. It, or if you become too famous. In, in a weird way, I think there was always a part of me that, like, I just wanted to help audiences who might have the same problem that I had, which was I, I, I just wanted to see a character yeah. in a story. I didn't want to see a famous person. 
playing a character mm. in a story. And it's once I became a certain level of famous, I was aware that I couldn't just get lost in the character anymore. I was like, oh, I wonder, is that relationship still working out with them? <laughs> no, while I'm watching the movie. And, <laughs> and instead of just getting lost in it, and the, the most dynamic and exciting experiences for me were, were the ones where it wasn't the most uh, established actors. It was just the most convincing yeah. actors that maybe had less exposure that were transforming. But I, 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 I've often thought what must be great maybe about a career like yours is that you must have people coming up to you all the time but come up to you for completely different things. So you'll have people coming up to want to talk about George Mason from 24 or to talk about Gregory from Walking Dead, or to talk about Apollo 13, or to talk about Heat, or whatever it might be. So, you know, um, you've got such a wide range of things that it must be, you know, you must have different people wanting to talk about different, you know, different things. Yeah, in a way, uh, I cultivated a, a, to what to what extent I am in any way uh, known by people when I go out in the world, depending upon where I go, Um there, there was always a the cinephiles. Again, I think I was trained in a way to appeal to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they'll, they'll watch a movie more than once uh, if it's their cup of tea. And uh, starting with Mommy Dearest was my yeah, first movie, yeah. and so I, I was uh, immediately identifiable to the gay crowd, which frequented that movie <laughs> multiple times. <laughs> You know, like a Rocky Horror picture show, sort of where they would go and bring their wire hangers and go, no more wire hangers. And of course, immediately, Christopher, you know, they would be across the way, anywhere. And I'll never forget one time, I, I got, I had this, an old beat up convertible and uh, I pulled up next to my, my eight, when they first, ATMs first came out. Yeah. And I, I was going in to get a little cash out of the machine, and and this this tall black queen from behind me goes, "Oh, look, that bitch didn't even leave you enough money for it." <laughs> and you know that that there was always like a crowd uh, who would identify. And then shortly after that, Sid and Nancy suddenly, by playing the drug dealer and yeah, Sid yeah, Nancy, yeah. that New York, a sort of emblematic New Yorker. Um, street life low life character appealed to a certain crowd of, yeah. of punks yeah. and new yorkers and anytime i would go to new york people go hey man i do you i can't believe it i'm seeing that and and there would be this whole like a cult of uh so it was but it was a mini sub sub cult and of people that ever recognized me at any given time and and uh terminator 2 gearheads uh, kind of, you know, <clears throat> a, a totally different crowd. Yeah, yeah. Picked up on that one, and uh, sort of that group that were about twelve boys that were about twelve years old when Terminator Two came out. <laughs> at each age, as they, now they're like I think they're, they're probably about cl closing in on fifty. <laughs> they're in their forties, but they, at, at every step along the way. They were like that movie got watched so many yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are people that watch it like fifty times. Yeah. So they, I was always Todd to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and you know, so there was, and then you know, maybe because I played a bigger role in Air Force One, I got a lot and Candy Man and certain movies that became very popular. People would identify me from, but usually because they could watch it more than once. And and it was and I always knew that about TV and I would literally I would go down because I wanted them I needed desperately needed the money I was always in, in the risk of the the not having enough yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. never the having too much uh, that my mother warned me about um, and so I would dip in and do uh, guest stars on television yeah. and I sort of used guest stars on television from right after Mommy as soon as I got the seal of approval that. I could appear on film and not turn it into an eggplant. Yeah. Um, which is because I, I, I went through a year when I first moved out there of getting like a hundred callbacks and never getting the job because I'd never been on film before. Yeah. Something weird might happen. Just don't know. And then somebody gives you the seal of approval and then you're okay. And so immediately, as soon as I was cast in Mommy Dearest, I started getting hired. And I got hired 
and I, I had my agents because it was just a whole new world. And I realized at the minute I was on a film set that this is very different from the theater. Yeah. And I just wanted to like get, get training in working with cameras. And so I said, look, I don't want to be in another big movie immediately. I want to be, uh, just get me in any, like, look, they needed a bad guy on every episode of television. Every <laughs> week, right? I can do any accent. I can transform into any. So let's just go for the bad guy. Yeah. Because already there was already a sense of political correctness in Hollywood, even in in 1980, that said if we can avoid casting the black guy as the bad guy or the Latino as the bad guy, let's 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 do that. Uh, let's avoid that cliche and and uh, reinforcing that negative stereotype. But the weird, the you know, the strange, you know, white kid with the big blue eyes and the <laughs> eating hairline he could be psychos he could be drug addicts <laughs> you know murderers and, and victims you know, like all kinds of twisted things and and uh, so and i was willing to transform and and i i'm as a makeup artist i was able yeah. to change like the way i looked and go into an office and convince them because they always said in la you have to show them the person when you walk in they don't yeah. have imaginations that was the thing and as opposed to new york in the theater it, uh-huh. was, it was respect for the craft here they yeah, yeah, i don't yeah. want to know about the craft i just want to see the guy <laughs> waiting to see you walk in the door and so and and so by walking in the door as slightly deranged and or offbeat characters in the beginning uh, and being visually convincing as well as behaviorally convincing yeah. they they, I always, I was always there on time. I always knew all my lines, and I, you know, never caused problems. So I got hired again and again. But I think people kind of went, "He's a fucking freak, right?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> been disturbing about that guy. I just wanted to get the jobs, and and so I got those jobs. But I think I did get stigmatized and pigeonholed a little bit uh, as bad guys. And then, like, down to the point where I would have a friend directing a movie down the line and go. And they go, well, what about this part? And they'd say, well, we, we have to like him. <laughs> no, no, you like me. We've been for two, 20 years. <laughs> and they'd say, yeah, well, I know, I know. But just as, as soon as we see this guy, we have to like him. And I go, well, if, if and well, you've just done so many of those, you know, horrible people. <laughs> you've been a prick so many times. <laughs> so many times. That's what they're going to see when they look at you and, and I go, but you know, if you're supposed to like him, I promise you'll like him. <laughs> Is that why maybe then, maybe like someone like George Mason from 24, maybe that would appeal to you then? Because that was a huge arc, wasn't it? Um... Yeah. Kind of the redemption thing, because he's even now, um, and I was doing a little bit of research before I wanted to talk to you just about because I loved 24 back in the day, we watched it, and it became this cultural phenomenon, didn't it? You know, within you know, pretty quickly. Nina, Nina Myers will walk through that door at any given moment. She <laughs> She's a nasty so. piece of work. <laughs> oh, I've got to tell you as well, just before I, I say, when I was saying to my, my, my daughter, my wife, that I was speaking to you, and they went. Uh, Xander Berkeley. I went and showed you the picture. I went, oh my God! I went, and then um, my my daughter went. Hang on a minute. He's married to that's that's um, B- Bella Swan's mum uh, in in Twilight. I went yeah. Uh, so and, and then and then my wife said, uh, but his wife was also in Bosch. I went yeah. So they were they were unfortunately more interested in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Maybe, Sorry maybe, about that, man. Maybe. But you know that's how we. <laughs> I don't blame them. I was more interested. In <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, twenty four. So I mean, was that why, in terms of the the character arc, that's what maybe appealed to you in terms of going from this bit of a prick to yeah, and, a good and guy? Sarah, you're you know. meeting Sarah. Did, it, was, it wasn't a series regular the first year. It was just a uh, recurring role. Yeah, and they knew I, I was, uh, you know, reluctant to to do a series, and then I was still film was it was that was right that was a big game changer that show. You yeah. know, uh, the the way in which they were able to delve into a character study because they weren't introducing another bad guy every episode. Yeah, yeah. Because they were following an hour of real time every episode and a, a whole se- season was one day of depth psychology yeah. in a handful of characters. Was that difficult to film as well? Um, you know, the the fact that it was supposed to be in real time and was did that 
you know, bring up a whole different types of problems for you as an actor as well. The fact that it's supposed to be in real time and the continuity and that yeah. sort of thing. It was just a fascinating um, new experience. Uh, and there was a sense that you could uh, experience um, a, a character on a really deep level. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, 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 the constraints of, of continuity and stuff are difficult in any situation. In a way, it was easier with 24 because you never had to change your costume. Yeah, true. Yeah. One day. Uh, so there, at least there wasn't that. To go, oh, my God, I'm not supposed to be wearing. <laughs> <laughs> and like I, say, uh, like I say, it was an interesting experience because not only was it this cultural phenomenon that you took place in, but you managed to snag a wife as well, which, you know, you know, it's pretty good going, really, I suppose, you know. Yeah, and I, I thought I was going to have to go back to New York to find a wife at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and then New York came to me. Um, but the uh, do you still get people? The, do you still get people asking you about George and Twenty Four? Is it still because yeah, I mean it's yeah, like that left a real impression on people. And I think because Joel and and uh, Howard was helping to run the show at that point, but uh, Bob Corcoran uh, and Joel were the head writers the first year, and and they they turned over a lot of stuff, and they, they liked I the uh, the kind of sarcasm, the, the, the irony and uh, sort of gravitas and uh, cryptic humor of George Mason was, was something that I brought to yeah. the pilot that wasn't in the script particularly. And they immediately picked up on that and wanted to write him into the show uh, and not just have it be a guest star thing. Yeah. And, uh, and I met Sarah on the pilot, and we'd connected and become immediately, and you know, we were off to the races. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I, I was very open when the show got picked up to coming back. And um, so they, they wrote stuff for me, and then they allowed me to rewrite stuff. Okay. And, and, and Kiefer... Um, was you know a film guy as well who was coming into tv and and the guy that was uh um stephen hopkins who was the director of every other episode who established who shot the pilot mm -hmm. established the look and vibe of the show um was the we were sort of together whenever we had scenes that some of those scenes were the hardest ones to sort of make feel right and they kind of wrote a blueprint in some ways and a lot of the dialogue came across as rather um, stiff and we go well, at this isn't working we you know you have your rehearsal yeah before the camera crew is brought in and you go okay what's this what are we trying to say in this scene and, and how do we say it um in a way that sounds convincing um and we would just break it down and improvise a little bit and then rework massage it yeah, into yeah. place and that became kind of a practice that was from the the pilot on uh a little bit and because they, they were around and they would they go yeah 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 that, that that's fine that works that works and then they, they just sort of became a practice of of uh we were given a certain degree of trust and and uh sarah and i would work on stuff together uh because we were together even though they didn't know it yet <laughs> on episodes that we were involved in and and um, and then, uh, there was just a, a general sense that the show was, you know, just going into, it, it, I didn't think it was going to get picked up originally because back then in syndication, you had to watch things, be able to watch a show out yeah. of order. Yeah. And this is a show you could never watch out of order. So I thought it was tenuous at best at getting picked up, but uh -huh. it did. And it just became the zeitgeist phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 9-11 had just happened. It connected so closely to the events of 9-11 that that and the modern technology, the way yeah. they divided the, the storyline, it was just very, uh, it became the first show to be binge watched. And so that was clear right from the first season. Um, and they enticed me in to become a regular by saying, what if you <laughs> inhale airborne plutonium <laughs> the first or second episode and you only have 24 hours to live. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd be dead by the end of the season. I said, that sounds amazing. Because it also sounded like a, 
I wasn't just going to be used as this device to come in and tell Kiefer, no, you can't do that. <laughs> well, maybe, but this is the last time. And, and so I, uh, I was able to take things in a different direction. There's yelling at dog going on. I'm going to be right back. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, the, uh, the, the thing that ended up happening with it was, was really great because they had to give him a redemption. And I, a lot of the characters, because I had played some pretty bad guys at that point had gone redemption free yeah. and, uh, I just been, you know, brought to justice and <laughs> that's where I would leave. Um, and you know, in the first season, I, I, I you know, I, I, sort of uh i forget what the term is but I, I i kind of uh got into it with the producer a few times saying am i just being a prick to be a prick <laughs> i mean it seems gratuitous <laughs> at a certain point why am i being such a dick <laughs> uh, and he said well we have one rule on this show and that is you can never bore <laughs> And I said, okay, I don't, I don't want to bore anybody. I don't want to bore anybody, but I also want them to believe I'm a human being. Yeah, you can be like, nice as well. You can be interesting and yeah. nice, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's different ways of going at it. And uh, because they find that if you're, you know, God knows that's what Gregory was on The Walking Dead, a total device, is a, a tool by which to make others look noble and good. <laughs> by um, but, uh, and, and they never did provide a redemption for him and so i was eternally grateful that they they came up with this idea that then uh shoehorn them into a man trying to make up for a life yeah. misspent yeah and uh and how interesting that became when you got to see a guy who you didn't think had it in him suddenly have to come to terms with the fact that he's dying and and he's got to try and make use of the little bit of time he has mm. left to try and make up for what he'd done wrong and and that was like a an incredible thing to get to play on film and and it was a real powerful way to finish as well because i mean i can remember at the time you know <clears throat> i watched it with my wife and we we're kind of like you know we were in tears watching it because it was just like it was, it was a, just a really cool moment you know you got somebody who was you know was a bit of a prick a bit of a dick but it had this really powerful like you say redemption oh and by the and by the end of it he was almost the hero you know it was, it was so cool yeah. you know it was really cool um oh, and I came close to being a fucking hero. I know, oh, yeah, and you were almost nice <laughs> at the end as well. Almost, not quite. But, oh. <laughs> you talked about Gregory. <laughs> oh, you know, um, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, Gr Gregory is is a bit of a weasel. Is a bit of a, a bit, he's in the comics as well. So you know, uh, did did you were you aware of the? I mean, obviously you're aware of the Walking Dead, but had you seen the series before? My dog's trying to get into frame. <laughs> Pepe wants in on this. Come on, Pepe, come on. You, you, come on in. Come on. Come on. Oh, my God. What? Bring it in. How gorgeous come is on. that? <laughs> what was I saying? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, had you seen The Walking Dead before you No, got I the... hadn't seen any of it. Uh, Sarah had seen a little bit when we were shooting Nikita in Canada. She would got started getting into a little bit, and I'd watched it a glimpse, but I was working, and... I didn't uh, take it in, um, and <clears throat> and then um, they approached me to play this part, and I remember sort of we were just reading the description. <laughs> and I got, uh, yeah, now why would I want it? Because you know, I'd, I'd had a little redemption. I'd, I'd been able to play some <laughs> other kinds of characters, and I had been, you know, resisting at at, at, certain, <laughs> at great expense. I had been resisting playing those kinds of characters because I was trying to work my way out of Hollywood hell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and trying to capitalize on the, the sort of the reversal. And, um, and you know, even like with Nikita, I could, I don't know if you ever saw any of I that. Did. Yeah, I saw Nikita. Even though he was a villain, <coughs> um, there was a way you could justify his his thinking and there was a, a reasoning behind it that that to me kept him from being a, a villain I, I could still play lots of colors and yeah yeah and, and, and i could feel like there was a reality and a truth to it and uh same thing with salem which i'd done in the meantime and and lots and lots of movie parts that i'd done in the interim um 
but to come in and do a series that's as popular as that, playing a, a shit heel like that, you know, it's like, <laughs> considering like, I got these two kids, I want them to someday see, you know, flip on the the uh, the TV and see me being something other than that, and um, and they gave me all the talk about how popular the show is and what it does for people. It's all oh, this is going to make my career. Is that what it's going to do? I don't know. I, don't know. I think you could put a stake in the heart of it. Uh, I play this guy convincingly. And, uh, but the, the Scott Gimple got me on the phone, and, and his pitch was that he used to be in comedy, he used to write comedy. Yeah. He's always seen my sense of humor in the stuff that I've done and felt like uh, I needed an opportunity to do more comedy. And that they wanted and needed to have somebody who could crack the window open and let a fresh breeze blow in from another direction to lift some of the turgidness yeah. of what was happening as the Southern drama uh, that it was becoming. Yeah. And I went, oh, okay, all right, well, so I can serve a good purpose for the show. I can get my kicks by being funny, but still keeping it real. Um, but yeah, if you write me funny stuff, that 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 sounds like it might be fun. Um, I don't mind sacrificing my vanity and being <laughs> anxious and being uh, <laughs> despicable. And, yeah, playing the coward. Playing the coward. I've played a lot of bad guys. I've never played the coward before. Yeah. And I know that there's a certain, uh, you know, you're warned against it because it's a weak way to be presented and. Uh, and especially in the context of a show like that, it's almost like you could, obviously you could be Negan and, and bash in yeah, beloved yeah. character's brains to the mud and still be cool and still be uh, worshipped by fans. But if you uh, run from an, an encounter and, and you rat somebody else out or you you know, you fail at hitting on someone or, you know, any of these despicable mm. qualities that you are not forgiven. Yeah. And, and I, I kind of had enough sense just from the map, the blueprint, because they didn't want to show me any actual script. Yeah. Lest they know. when I tell somebody about a lie and I don't know what the, <laughs> but you know, they're just giving me all the hints and all the hints indicated that this guy was going to be unctuous. <laughs> and I remember at the end of the first season going, Okay, well, I think I played about every color in the Unctuous <laughs> Rainbow for you. Got any hope of a redemption? And Scott said, mm -mm. well, the thing that's important to understand about Gregory, R.E., the unctuousness, is that, uh, it's really more of a feature than a bug. And it was the first time I'd heard that. Uh, you know, right, right, right. It's pithyism. And more of a feature than, okay, so, the, so he's, isn't that kind of not really human? in a way, to not have any crack in the armor that lets a little light in at any point. Yeah. So that's a done deal like nothing is going to change in this in this guy. And he said, well, that's how he functions in the comic book, and that's pretty much how we need him to function. So, I'm yeah, I'm just the antagonist. I, I get it. I get it. I'm there to make others... Look, Look good. good. <laughs> was it? Was it? I get it. Uh, which is fine, though. You know, which is it's still cool. Yeah. Did, was it difficult to fit in? Because I mean, what was it? Season six, I think you got. So was I mean, it... Andy Lincoln is such a prince. He's the guy that you know. He was the number one on the call sheet. Never in all my years have I seen a more gracious and uh, welcoming host. That's nice to hear. Work. That's nice to hear. Just an exquisite human being. Um, so no, he, and, and, and to his credit, he wasn't one of these guys that you can't make him look weak or bad for a split second without him having a connection like so many, I hate to say it, people who become movie stars. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can't knock him because it's the road not taken. Uh, but there, a lot of them won't show a moment of weakness or a moment of, yeah, I mean, I won't name Nez, but... and their protection of their image and all of us are so intertwined. Yeah. That, uh, you know, even when you're the bad guy who is going to get crushed in the end and is going to be made into a, a fool and all the rest of it, they can't... A lot of movie stars, yeah. big movie stars, have a really hard time in the beginning of the story 
you know, so you're not playing the end at the beginning. So yeah. you have a journey to travel with the audience. Yeah. You're, you try and go, well, I think I kind of actually have to be, have the power at this point. To yeah. Get it away. We, we, we talked about this it, at the end. In 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 a podcast episode a few weeks ago, I won't name him name any names, but Zach and I talked about um, very famous actor who's got written into his contract that he can only be hit so many times, and he has to be he has to win so many fights during the film, and you know these are kind of like, you know, it's like that's absolutely yeah. madness, you know. <laughs> it's madness, and then when you have to be like when you're a serious actor, and you think you're going to be dealing with an actor, but you're really looking at at a, a sort of a commodity that's being protected by a, a personal PR firm themselves, uh, rather than like thinking the logic of the story and the characters yeah. and their relationships to each other. You can get TV's but Andy in the very first scene when I come out and uh, when I first introduced the, at Hilltop up there, yeah. and they all traipse in and they're filthy and I send them off to get cleaned and come back down and, and uh, I'll meet with them when they get back. Yeah. And he's like, no, we're, we're good. And I, and I opted to, in the first rehearsal, get right up in his grill and go, I said, when you go up and take a shower, <laughs> you can come back down and we'll talk to you. Hmm? And uh, whatever the line was. And he, he, you know, and then I, I go away and, and, I thought we we're just going to get ready and just run it again. Maybe the director will come in and say, uh, "You can't get that close to him, <laughs> you know, because he, he'd kill you." Uh, he's the star of our show, and you know, we just, uh, <laughs> you know, and, you know, there's a lot of yeah, yeah, rules. yeah. And uh, and instead, the door flies open, and Andy comes running in and, and lifts me up off the ground and spins me around, going, "Oh, I'm so fucking glad you're doing this." <laughs> and, and, uh, just, you know, that was how it started. So that whatever ice, because I had to do a scene with all of the, you know, the veteran yeah, stars. Yeah. So yeah. It, it was my space that they're coming into, but I'd never been in that space before that day. Yeah, and they'd yeah. been there for six years. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, he broke the ice immediately. And I watched him do it again and again with people that just had little parts on the show. He would just go up and put his arm around him and just like, you know, and not in an affected way, but in a genuine yeah, way. And he yeah. was that with the whole, whole crew and it was, we're all pulling on the same end of the rope. Yeah. That's as really cool. To so many stars, so many number ones, they're at one end of the rope and the rest of the show is at the other end, constantly being tugged by their ego. <laughs> and he, and, and he wasn't that ever for a second. He was so dedicated and, set such a high standard of working in the blistering heat and throwing himself physically into it, even when it was off camera. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I think everybody uh, picked up the vibe from the start and uh, said, if he's going to behave that way, there's no room for the prima donna bullshit that so many other shows get into. And, and it was just a great atmosphere on set because of that. That was real. That's real cool to hear. I mean, I've I've heard. I mean, I've talked to a couple of people from that been involved, and they said the similar sort of thing. It was a, you know, it's a kind of happy set. You know, the the heat is always, always comes. You know, the work, the heat of working in that part of the country and everything always comes across as being really difficult. Um, what have you done the cons? Have you done like the Walker Stalker and all that stuff? Then how did I did a little bit? I, I didn't like the vibe of those people. I'm pretty intuitive about people, and there was something really, nasty. yeah, yeah, and and it all turned out to be true. Uh, you know, there's a lot of money to be made for people, I guess, uh, not for me because um, because uh, Gregory nobody wanted his autograph i mean there were oh. fans of mine that would come trickling through every now and again people <laughs> that knew me from other things but basically well, nobody wants the, the the douche waffles photograph i would have the douche person. waffles photograph i would have the douche waffle photograph yeah, yeah, yeah you <laughs> because you're a cinephile uh, <laughs> but you know you have uh, discerning tastes and you see the subtlety and nuance that goes into building a character a lot of the people that go to those shows just wanted uh you know the obvious autographs yeah and uh you know doing something weird and quirky on the show and you know whatever just being like a uh you know like an also ran like smaller character with a with a gag would have gotten me 
a better responses to those things than being Gregory because people just come up and go, why are you so mean to Maggie? Because <laughs> that's, that's in the script, man. Oh, it's the words I was given. <laughs> this show did not allow any rewrite. It's, like it's not a documentary. It's a, it's, it's a piece of fiction. Yeah. What, what's a piece of work, if you had to choose, if you could choose one particular role, any role, what's the thing that you're most proud of? As an as an artist, as a as an actor, is a one well, role that you, you know, think? I think this movie, uh, sort of, well, there's two two, two things. Um, the booth at the end was a really cool little uh, web series that I did. That uh, I think the second season is still playing on Amazon Prime now. Uh, it, the first came and went. It, we did it for virtually nothing, and we shot it in ten days. The first season, and the same with the second, shooting five days, two days off, another five days on. Um, it was like an experiment in the early days of web series, like about 10 years ago, um, that um, play, I played a character who sits in the back booth of a diner that people find out can make things happen. Right. And they come and and, uh, and I assign a task. You don't know, I've made, I consult a book you, you don't really get to see and it's ominous looking and yeah. so you don't really know where he's from or... Uh, what side he's on but he uh, assigns a task if you want this to happen this is what you have to do it's, it's up to you um, I'm, I have no dog in the race but that's what you need to do in order for it to happen and you have to also the other caveat is you have to report back on the progress yeah. and a lot of times they were unsavory or certainly against character uh, assignments given to people and they and the weaving of the of the way their stories would weave together and because he's clearly not supposed to interfere in the course of human destiny, so there's a counterbalancing that's going on somehow. Mm. But he's taking a basically a, a sort of a, a compass on human morality in the first season, and then trying to understand what their whole preoccupation with love, the concept of right, love, is right. in the second season. But there, it was just really interestingly well written, and. Uh, I got to collaborate on the writing as well, and uh, it was uh, written a bit so that it was a, it had such a great concept, but a lot of the voices in in each of the characters had a similar sound, and yeah. so I got to write the differentiation between characters into it a little bit and the polish or two, and and uh, and it all held together really well, and and then we did a second season, and. Um, that you got a bunch of awards for the streamies and I got a bunch of acknowledgement for it for those that saw it, but not that many people saw it. Um, but it remained a favorite. And uh, the, the maestro recently, a few years ago, shot a movie about a guy who was uh, a composer exiled from Mussolini's Italy. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Mario Castelnovo Tedesco who's becoming better known now, um, but was uh, a composer of 200 films, didn't get credit for them back in the 40s, 30s and 40s, and, and then became the teacher, uh, compo composition teacher to the greatest composers of the 20th century for film. He yeah. became the sound of what what film sounds like. And uh, and then his generation of, of uh, students, all John Williams and Henry Mancini and Jerry Goldberg and and just uh goldsmith sorry um and uh andre previn and just all kinds of people studied with them right down to randy newman and uh learned about film composition from him and he had a great influence but it's basically a story about the love of of the artist's journey sometimes painful and sometimes heartbreakingly beautiful and and um uh, how he taught a, a great teacher and so the maestro in a way the ultimate redemption character for me because i've, I've managed to learn a lot over yeah. the years about a lot of things that i was able to bring into the character in the in the rewriting of that script as well and uh and the playing of the character and uh yeah two others um i'm sure they'll occur to me Along the way, you know, you have favorites along the way, favorite experiences as you, much as 
anything having to do with yourself or yeah. your character. Can, can you watch Sid yourself? Experience with... oh, so, uh, Sid and Nancy is, is an interesting example. So it's a, I think it's a really underrated film. It's... it's um, you know, for I mean, it was it was quite well received at the time. But it, uh, you know, I was never a punk, but I like a lot of the kind of music around. You know, that time I was a fan of the Sex Pistols to a certain extent. Um, but I think it was um, it didn't. I don't know if it did great business at the time, but I think it's a it's a really underrated kind of study of that particular era. It's, I think it's a fabulous film and it stands up really well. Um, I watched it about yes. about a year ago and it's it kind of stands up really well from you know depicting that time what. 77, 78 would be, wouldn't it? That it was, it was depicting it was then. Yeah, we shot it in 85, but it was a depiction of the late 70s yeah. in New York. And not just New York, but London and New York. And, and uh, it, it was um, a scene of people that came together to make that movie. It was Alex Cox, obviously, yeah. the yeah. director, coming off of Repo Man and the success of that. Um, but he, he got Roger Deakins to be his cinematographer and he got Gary to be his star and Gary hadn't done a film before and yeah. Roger had only done a few and and, uh, and there was just something in the air in the telling of that story for whatever reason it was just uh, and I, I went on and did two more films right after that with Alex just because there was something so dynamic all the musicians who were involved in creating the score were were more layered than just the obvious punk rockers um because you know the clash joe strummer was very involved in the score of, of those yeah, films yeah, and, yeah. And, and he was more than just a punk there was something else going on uh and and the pogues were a kind of irish folk punk yeah 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 entity but they they were obviously not just like the three chord yeah yeah uh, headbangers they were head banging, but they were they were banging their heads up against big ideas yeah, and, yeah. and poetry and stuff like that as well. And and uh, and Elvis Costello had been involved in the music as well, came in and, and played a part in, in Straight to Hell. And we were all in Spain, in El Maria, Spain, and and the continuing of these relationships. A lot of the people that had been involved with Nancy coming together with the music people and. And then off to Nicaragua when the war was going yeah, on. So yeah. We were there for three months, and that was a very bonding experience. And so there, there's a kind of, um, you know, and Gary and I established a friendship shooting Sid and Nancy that's lasted a lifetime. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, it was really great to see, not this year, but the year before, to see Gary and Roger both get their first Academy Award. That was really kind of just really? how that took so long for that to happen. I don't, no. I, I don't no, know. Kidding. Wanted... But you know, sometimes great things take a while for people to get. You know, and Siskel and Ebert did have Sid and Nancy in their top ten of the eighties at the end of the decade. Um, so there were people, critics got it, but I think a lot of times I've always been drawn to like Mike Figgis. I did four movies with him, another great British director, and and. Uh, who shot films in America and, and um, you know the, a lot of times the pioneers discover territories that become inhabited by a larger population mm. after a certain period of mm. time and uh, I, I've always been drawn to the, the pioneers uh, in, in filmmaking as well as those that are you know established like Spielberg and yeah. uh, Wolfgang Peterson and Clint Eastwood and Jim Cameron these are the giants of of uh, of popular film, and I've always been fascinated by that as well, because I always love going to the movies. I love going to art films, and I love going to big box box office. Yeah, thanks. Um, but I, I I do I do love film, and and so I was always drawn to keep learning about it because I want to start uh, when I grow up. Uh, I, I want to become a director someday. I wanted I, to keep learning. I say the same thing. When I grow up, I want to do this. I want. To, I want to be a you know do a proper thing. When I grow, when I get older, you know. what's the future yeah. hold then for Xander Berkeley? Then what's what's the? I mean, obviously we've got the, this thing going on at the moment. What what's in the pipeline? Once well, every once got, the world returns to normal. Three properties. I mean, we live here by the by the sea. We're on uh, on the bay here in 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 uh, Maine, um, but. Uh, is that the other one? <laughs> the other one. Um, and uh, but we got a farm about an hour 
west of here, and uh, and then a mansion, um, an old rundown mansion from the uh, late 18th century nearby that work together. You can put people up or film in either of those yeah. places. And uh, so looking to uh, attract uh, friends from my lifetime of working in the film industry <laughs> to uh, this beautiful part of the world and uh, work on interesting experimental and, um, you know, independent films here. Yeah. And make the possible that the, uh, the the mansion itself is a great location for an anthology series. So I'm in talks with people nice, about developing nice. that and just creating material content for, you know, that's just powerfully interesting writing uh, for great actors and uh, getting great cinematographer friends to That sounds so cool. That sounds so cool. Great musician friends to help create a score for it as we're building it. And so that's really what I'm working on. Nice. Listen, Zander, thank you, man, for, for letting me take your time on on this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> it's been a blast. I am genuinely a fan, and I've loved I've loved a, you know a lot of the work that you've done. Um, and just real thank you for the time that you've given me. It's been it's been a blast. It's been a real honour. And um, I could yeah. talk I could talk proper film with you all day. You know, if you ever get the chance again, let's just talk old movies. Cause yeah. I could, uh, we're, I could we're, talk. we're all constrained, you know. We're in our home, so uh, uh, a lovely pleasure to have met you. I look forward <laughs> to talking further down the line. Could you do me just? Exactly.